Good afternoon, everybody. It's Greg Schnell, and I am here with Martin Pring for the July Market Roundup. We have lots to talk about. Uh, the, the market has been uh, sideways for a while and recently started to turn up, and I'm very interested to see what Martin's charts show for the half year. Martin, are you with me? I certainly am. I'm always with you, Greg. You <laughs> <laughs> had a great, a great holiday in Jasper. Yeah, I was up driving through the ice fields, and it's just such a beautiful valley. I drove up a few days ago and came back yesterday. It was crazy good how pretty it was. So that yeah, was nice. Uh, back in the office, ready to get back to work here, so things are going well. Um, Martin, perhaps we can um, – let's jump into your charts, and I might interrupt here a few times because you've got lots of good ideas there. And um, what have you got to share with us so far? Okay, well, the main thing, I think, is the fact that a lot of my indicators for the stock market, and I'm talking about long-term indicators, not short-term stuff, have started to edge up and uh, starting to look bullish. So we'll be covering a lot of that today. So cool. the first thing, then, is it's going to come up. Yeah, several long-term stock market indicators have gone bullish. Last month, they were kind of teetering. Now they've gone more decisively bullish. So that's great news, I think. Also, the 12-month rate of change for the 10-year yield is overextended, just at the point where people probably thought yields were going to continue to come down. Uh, and the, when this uh, rate of change reverses, uh, we've seen very, very consistent um, turning points in yields over the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years. It doesn't mean to say that yields can't continue to come down some more, but we'll take a look at that chart and I'll get into it in, in, uh, in greater detail. The other thing is that we've had a, a really big drop in the long-term yields, and now in the last few weeks, that's begun, that's begun to affect some of the shorter-term stuff. So we'll look at that too. Uh, some people don't think the breakout in gold uh, is a valid one on the upside. Of course, we never know until afterwards, but I think there's a number of uh, factors which suggest that uh, the breakout to gold to the upside is a valid break, and we will see significantly higher gold prices. So we we'll look at that too. And finally, um, I'm very interested to know what's going to happen to commodities because the long-term momentum of a lot of the commodity indexes is very overextended on the downside, but, it, but it's still declining. And one of the leading indicators of commodities, is not, cons not every, on every turning point, uh, but in many, many situations in the past, um, the Canadian dollar has been a leading indicator for commodities, not, not by a, anything that you can define and say, well, it's bottom today, it's going to go up tomorrow, because the leads and lags are different in each cycle. And some cycles, uh, they're coincident. But I, I, we're going to take a look at the Canadian dollar to see what that looks like. So let's take a look now at the, a couple of indicators for the World Stock Index, the MSCI, uh, ACWI. And the first chart shows you the copper curve. And normally with the copper curve, you just let the curve turn up. And when it turns up from below zero, that gives you a buy signal. But in this case here, I've thrown in a moving average because there have been on a couple of occasions where it started to just ever so gently turn up just here in 1977. And it, it, was, it, did, it was close to the bottom, but uh, it, it, then gave a, it then went back down again. So if you're looking for the slope of the curve, sometimes you can get some whipsaws. So that's why I put a six month moving average in there. And you can see we got a host of um, solid arrows. And in the presentation, the solid arrows represent valid signals where we would have made a profit. And the dashed arrows or the dashed red arrows or lines, vertical lines, represent failures of the particular mm -hmm. technique that I'm, um, I'm talking about at the time. So here we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. <coughs> Excuse me. Successful signals, and one and one failure in two thousand and one. And you notice in two thousand and one, the uh, indicator, the uh, index was below its twelve month moving average, whereas now it's above its twelve month moving average. So I've got a couple of question marks because it started to turn, but it hasn't quite gone bullish at, as at the end of June. But if we look at it on the with the stock charts chart. Uh, which plots it to, with, the, uh, with the, the, the beginning of the next month, July, uh, you can see that the um, COPIC indicator has actually started to turn up. Now, this is a bit of a cheat because we're looking at a monthly close here, and uh, the latest plot of data up here is actually the first 
trading day of the month, and it's only just marginally higher. So we can't we can't really say that it, that the the COPAC has actually turned up until the end of the month. But it, it's, I put it in there just to show that uh, with a month where we're kind of basically unchanged, that would give us a, a buy signal there. So that, that looks pretty interesting. One that's already given us a buy signal is this one here where we're comparing the global index with my global diffusion index, indicator, I should say. And what we do here is we look at a universe of individual country eat, um, indexes, not ETFs, indexes and local currencies, figure out the percentage above their 18 month moving average, that's what the 18 means. And then because that would be pretty jagged, we smooth it with a six month moving average which is what the six means, and that's what the black plot is. And the red dashed line is the nine month moving average of that black uh, plot, which is the eight, six month moving average of the 18 month rate of change, of the, of the 18 month moving average. So the idea is you get a vertical green line, a solid green line, which indicates a valid buy signal. When it reverses direction from at or below this horizontal line here on the black line at zero. And on some of these charts you'll see, uh, a ratio like this one says 13 to 1. What that's telling you is so you don't have to count it. We have 13 buy signals which worked and one which didn't. This one over here with the red dash line in 2002. And here again, the uh, uh, index itself was below its uh, 12 month moving average. Well, fast forward to the current situation, and in June, late June, we saw it move sharply above the moving average giving us uh, the 14th buy signal since 1971. So that's, I think, pretty encouraging. Then we'll move over to the US, and here we've got the, I'm comparing the S&P Composite uh, with my economic diffusion indicator. And the red highlights represent recessionary periods. And the idea is that when the diffusion indicator starts to reverse to the upside from below zero, uh, that indicates that the economy is going to soon start to uh, expand at a, at a faster pace. And you can see that in some cases it's actually, um, it actually uh, coincides with the end of a recession just there. Uh, over here in 1960, it led the recession. So it's, it's partially a leading indicator of the economy. And um, the, it, it's actually a six month moving average. I'm talking about this blue line here, which is really a six month moving average of the gray solid line, which is the actual rule number. But you can see it, it moves around quite a bit. So that's why we need to have the six month moving average to make sure that uh, the trend is a trend is a trend, so to speak. Well, as you can see, it's uh, uh, 18 valid signals and three failures. One failure occurred in um, 1957. And two failures occurred in 2000, 2001. But notice in the 2000, 2001 period, the uh, S&P was below its 24-month uh, moving average, whereas today it's comfortably above. The other thing to notice about the current signal is the raw data is pretty high at, what's this, plus four and a half. We didn't see that when we had the other false signals. So here it never got that high in uh, 2001, 2002. And that 57 signal, Never got that high until starting in, in 1958 with the secondary signal here. Because it was a very, it was a really whipsawy time. Usually we don't get that kind of whipsaw behavior. So I'm looking at it now and saying, okay, here we go. We've got another buy signal. That suggests to me that um, the slowdown, the economic slowdown we've been seeing for the last, growth slowdown we've been seeing for the last um, year or so uh, is, 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 in a process where it's going to start to reverse. And so the next thing we're going to see is not a recession, but we're going to, it's, it, to me, this indicator is leading the, the economy higher. And at some time down the road, we're going to see some stronger uh, economic uh, figures. May not be next month or the month after, but it's definitely made the turn. And as you can see, the stock market anticipates those turns because every time this thing uh, turn, bottoms out, or 18 times and since 1955 when it's bottomed out, We've had a nice rally, uh, a nice rally in stocks, and once again, it's been the end of a uh, the end of a recession as well. So this suggests it's going to be the end of the slowdown because we aren't in a recessionary period here. Next chart shows the uh, real stock prices, CPI adjusted S and P composite, and we're comparing it to my financial asset velocity index. 
what this is is it combines the um, COPOC indicator or curve for bonds, which we use the TLT, stocks, we use the S&P composite, and for commodities, where we use the uh, CRB spot raw industrial as opposed to the CRB composite. CRB composite includes a lot of um, agricultural commodities and it's kind of partly weather driven, whereas the CRB uh, spot is purely uh, industrial commodities. So we add those three up together and the idea is that when, when the curve is rising, it indicates enough uh, liquidity is being pumped into the system to support t at least two out of three of those individual copper indicators that we're combining into one index. Uh, so that when, when we get a, a reversal to the downside and then it reverses to the upside like here, uh, and that gives us a buy signal for the market. When that happens, what's, what's happening under the surface is that we've already seen a decline in bond yields taking place. So the bond curve is starting to turn up. And it may be that the stock curve has also started to turn up or it starts to go down at a slower pace. The, 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 end of, the end product is that it has an effect of turning this indicator to the upside, indicating enough liquidity is going into the system to be consistent with rising stock prices. And the three markets are reflecting that, bond stocks and commodities in aggregate. So here we've seen, I didn't put the number of successful buy signals, but it's quite a few, one, two, it's about 38 since the 1880s or something like that. It's a, a lot of buy signals and, it's, and very, very few of these uh, buy signals, these green solid lines have been, um, could, could be, could be uh, called, called failures. In this chart here, we've got three failures in the 70s here, here, and over here in 2001, 2002. So on balance, it, it's, it's a pretty accurate indicator. And when you've got a number of these indicators that, are all, that have been pretty accurate in the past, none of them is perfect, you'll notice. They all, they all fail from time to time. But when you've got a consensus of these indicators pointing in a positive direction, it suggests that the market itself is going to move in a positive direction. So fast forward to the current, and we just got another buy signal where it not only bottomed out a couple of months ago, but this has now been confirmed by a moving average crossover. So one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that when interest rates start to fall, that's usually bullish for, stock market, for the stock market. Sometimes it isn't because there is a lead in the cycle between the low in interest rates and the low in the stock market. Sometimes they coincide, sometimes there's a, there's a lag. So you want to make sure if, you're, if you can see a change in short-term interest rates that that's being confirmed by uh, positive action in the stock market. So what we do here is we take a 12-month moving average of the commercial paper yield. And when the, the yield is below its 12-month moving average, then we say that the trend of interest rates is down, and that is, is going to be positive for stocks. But we have to wait and make sure that stocks agree, because if stocks don't agree, uh, then that means that the economy is probably too weak to, to be consistent with, with rising stock prices. So what we want to do is make sure that the stock market, the S&P, is above its 12-month moving average. So when you've got a trend of declining rates and, and rising stocks, that's when you get one of these green highlights. And you can see that it's, it's when we get one of these green highlights with stock market responding to lower interest rates, you usually get a good, a good bump in the stock market. And we've tested this back from between 1900 and, and, and 19, I think it was 2009 or something. And the S&P uh, experienced an, a monthly annualized gain of something like 16% compared to about 6% for a, the buy hold approach. So it's, a, it's been a pretty accurate indicator over the years. So when you get one a green highlight, that tells you you were in one of these good, positive environments for stocks. And what happened last month was the commercial paper went largely below its 12 month moving average. And since the stock market went above its 12 month moving average, you've got a green highlight again. What we don't know, of course, is whether we're gonna get one of these little I would call almost a whipsaw signal, or whether we're going to get a strong signal. But we're better off under the, under the green than we are under the red when both conditions reverse. In other words, when the stock market's below its 12-month moving average because it's responding to rising short-term interest rates. So just because short-term interest rates are coming down doesn't necessarily mean it's bullish for stocks. And I'll give you an example. Here we see a situation here where um, we're in the black, where the interest rates were coming down, 
but the stock market never responded to it. So you've got to make, you've got to make sure that the stock market is responding as it is now. So that's very positive. Next chart shows uh, a similar measure to what we saw with the, uh, the global. This is where we look at S&P groups and we measure the groups that are above their 18-month uh, moving average. And then we smooth that jagged number for a six-month moving average. And then we plot that and then run a nine-month moving average against that. So when it reverses to the upside from below zero or at zero, crosses its moving average, that gives us one of these green vertical lines. So you can see we've got 18 green lines and two red ones over here. Once again, the red ones always occur in the bear market. And they usually occur when the S&P is below its 12-month moving average. Fast forward to the present then, and what we see is we've got a buy signal here for this indicator. So there again, looking pretty positive. So move over to gold now, and gold tends to thrive when the dollar is in a bear trend. And one way of measuring whether the dollar is in a bear trend is to relate it to its 12-month moving average. If it's below its 12-month moving average, we say the dollar is coming down. And since the dollar moves inversely to gold, that should mean that gold is moving up. So when those conditions are, are, are holding, you find that with, with the gold above its nine-month moving average and the dollar below its 12-month moving average, that's when we get one of these green highlights. You can see all the, all the big bull markets or sections of the big bull markets have occurred when the dollar has been moving down and gold has been responding to that by trading above this dashed line, this 12 months, it's nine month moving average. But last month, of course, the gold price broke out uh, above this trend line here, so we get a green highlight. Uh, and we also saw gold break out in 1996. Incidentally, uh, <clears throat> it, I, do, I do know how to spell false, it's just that I didn't notice that in the presentation. So there's a false breakout developed under a rising dollar environment. So blue represents period when the um, dollar is above its nine month moving average and gold, and sorry, when gold is above its nine month moving average and the dollar is below its nine month moving average, 12 month moving average. So in this case here, the dollar was not supporting higher gold prices, which it is now. But having said that, uh, gold just fractionally broke its 12 month moving average last month. It was kind of almost a statistical quirk. So we really need to make sure that the, 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 uh, the dollar trades above, decisively above its moving average this month to give us a, a, a green signal. It could still break out with a blue signal, but it would be much better if it broke out with a green signal, meaning the dollar was coming down. And dollar is kind of a little bit iffy right now from trying to call uh, its direction. Also, on the breakout, we've got this um, KSG in a rising mode. So the next, final part of this presentation before we move over to stock charts is we're going to look at a uh, schematic diagram of the industry groups, the S&P industry groups. We've done this for the last couple of webinars. And I think it's quite helpful from pointing out where we are in a cycle and what groups or what sectors are likely to do well going forwards. So what this next diagram does is it tries to position um, bond stocks and commodities, and the various industry groups or sectors, main sectors, where they would fall currently in terms of their long-term KST. So this diagram here represents a theoretical long-term KST. And we put it into four different quadrants. The fall, when it's above zero and declining. The winter, when it's below zero and declining. Spring, when it's still below zero, but has now started to spring or move up. And then the markup phase is the summer when the indicator when the KST is in a positive mode. So if we're looking at a bear market situation uh, and a bottom of a bear market, what we would expect to see is a number of groups clustered in this area down here where they're in a position where they can either start to move to spring or they're, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> or they're already in spring and ready to move into the market phase of summer. So if you see a lot of groups in this area here, that tends to be very bullish. And if you see a lot of them over here in the fall, that's not so good because they've still got to come down and, and correct quite a bit. So let's take a look and see where we are now with these various groups. So here we've got the four quadrants in the four different colors. The, the, the thick line here represents the theoretical long-term KST. And when I press the uh, mouse button, 
that tells you where bonds are currently. Right? If you were to look at the TLT and look at its long-term KST, you see that it's above zero and starting to um, starting to uh, rally, extending its rally. And that's that's a, that's an ideal position to be in. If we look at stocks, it's kind of complicated because stocks, the S and P, uh, as we we'll look at later in, in reality, is the the, the uh, KST is falling but it's gone flat and usually when it when it goes flat or oftentimes when it goes flat it then starts to hook up again and instead of getting a buy signal down here below zero we get a buy signal that takes place above zero where it hasn't gone through its full corrective process that's what i call a high risk buy but high risk buys are usually just as reliable as the low risk buys in fact sometimes they're better because they're coming off a rising a period of overall rising momentum because you're above zero here. So that's where the S&P is right now. If it gets a bit stronger, it's going to hook up like this, and we then put it over here in the markup phase. But right now, it's just kind of basically flat. So I'm just putting it there to sort of indicate that the S&P does have the potential to give us that uh, high-risk buy signal. And then we look at industrial commodities, and we find that they are down here well uh in a well-established bear market but not quite ready uh not quite in the position where they've actually turned if they, they they could do it would need a bit of a rally here and then it could turn quite easily but in the moment that downtrend is still intact so now we're going to put up two more blocks of uh, arrows one will look at the early cycle leaders where they're positioned right now things like REITs um, and utilities and uh, consumer staples uh, housing those, those kind of things that are interest sensitive. And then we'll put a block of late cycle leaders, tend to be resource-based stocks and, 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 and some selected technology. So let's look at those and we'll put up the early cycle leaders first. And you can see that a lot of them are congregated in this positive area where we're into spring and we're into summer. And you see utilities here, consumer discretionary, REITs, staples, home builders, telecom, and some of them, uh, like we were looking at uh, brokers earlier this morning, and they look like they want to turn and start to move over to this side as well. And that's good because brokers have a tendency, just as the market discounts the economy, brokers tend to discount the economy, uh, uh, discount the market. And then finally, we look at the, um, the, la the, lagging, the lagging groups. And some of them are in, have moved over, semiconductors, industrials, technology, have moved over from this position here because they've just given one of these signals here where they came down and started to turn up. But uh, a lot, and others of them are uh, close to going into the into the summer quadrant here, and then even others like energy, oil, and gas and metals are well established on their downside. Just and you know they're positioned pretty well on the same position as the industrial commodities, which is what you would expect. So all in all, it looks to me like we're in a position where the market's being led or has been led for several months uh, uh, by these early cycle leaders, but now the list is beginning to broaden out in terms of those in the summer condition. And you can see also those in winter are in a position where they can soon start to turn into spring again. So that supports the idea that the stock market is going higher in my view. So now let me move over to the uh, stock charts platform. And we take a closer look at some of this stuff. Okay, Martin, so just before you go on there, I really like that uh, schematic diagram. When you talk about your long-term KST, like what is the cycle time that you're looking at for that? Is that mostly monthly or is it mostly, you know, how do you, how do you derive the long-term KST? Long-term is based on, ideally on an 18 month and 24 month rate of change. Those are the two dominant components. Okay. And, and it's really the 41 month business cycle because we, we've had since the 1950s, 17 recessions and slowdowns. And that translates to about 41 months in terms of the, uh, in terms of the cycle. We haven't seen recessions separated by 10 years, but we have seen these, uh, these slowdowns separating the recessions. So that's how we've been able to keep the economy going. So that the answer to that is about 18 to 24 months. Okay, cool. So what we're looking at now is the New York Stock Exchange Composite. And we have the KST. And you can see what I was saying before about the KST having gone flat. But it's not enough to do 
uh, something like this we did in 2013 where it came down and then started turning up again. So in that situation, it didn't go through the full corrective phase. It went through a corrective phase and then it started to turn up again. So we may be in a situation where that's about to turn. One reason that I think that's going to happen is because the Copic indicator in the bottom has just started to turn up when we start to put in plug in the beginning of July, just like it was doing for the for the world index. And if it's just starting to move up from here, obviously we've got a very nice consolidation reverse head and shoulders here that will break from. And usually when it breaks from something like this, we get a, a pretty um, pretty powerful move that takes place. So most of the time when that copper indicator turns up, you get a valid signal. There's an invalid signal in uh, 2002. But most of the time when it turns up, it, it means what it says from below zero or at zero. And that's, that's pretty encouraging. Next chart shows the uh, NYSE composite again. It's kind of showing you the difficulty of draw on a weekly chart of being able to draw the right trend line. One of them would be this dashed line joining the highs, uh, the three highs here. And then another one would, 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 be, uh, would, would join these highs here with that one there and ignore that high there. Either way, it tells us that it's just starting to nudge through some resistance here. And the most significant part of the chart, in my view, is this 26 week rate of change which is now broken above this downtrend line going all the way back to 2009. And in my experience, when a, a long-term trend line is broken on price, it has a very significant effect on that price because the long-term trend line is reflecting a long-term trend. The same thing can more or less be applied to momentum as well. And this is a very long-term momentum trend line. And it's been touched once, twice, three times, four times, or approached five times, six times. So it's pretty important. And it, you, you can't disagree with the idea that it's um, uh, broken the trend lines, broken it pretty decisively. So that, to me, is a positive factor. Another factor is the Abbas decline line has gone on to make a new high, whereas the um, New York Stock Exchange has, composite hasn't. I'd much rather the Abbas decline line leading us higher than the index leading us higher and the Abbas decline line lagging. Yeah, because, Martin, ha, have you done any work between the NASDAQ advanced decline and the New York composite? Because the, the NASDAQ seems to have some decay in it, but the New York composite, when that one breaks out, that seems to be the real deal. Yeah, that's a good point, Greg, because um, I haven't looked at the NASDAQ advanced decline that much um, recently because uh, when I used to do a lot of work on it in the, uh, in the 80s, uh, I used to find that it had a bit a permanent downside uh, bias. Yeah, I think that's true. And the right now, it's not breaking out yet. But again, the New York Composite has, and I tend to agree with you on the New York Composite. It's hard to argue with with that market breaking out to new highs on the advanced decline line. It seems to make a difference. Yeah, and you have to uh, you have to be careful. A lot of advanced decline lines, because uh, like, like the Nikkei, the Japanese market used to have um, a downward bias as well. I haven't seen it for years, but I know in, in the eighties and seventies it was definitely it was of no use whatsoever, except over analyzing short term trends. But if you're looking at long term divergences, you'd be you'd be short the you know a lot of these markets that have gone up tenfold. Yeah, so, not, not so great. So here's another positive indicator. This is the PPO where they using the parameters of 615, six months divided by 15 months. And I don't know why that parameter seems to work. It works beautifully for gold. Um, with the gold market, there's only been, I think, three whipsaws since the 1970s or something, maybe four, which is, which is pretty good. Uh, not all markets are that good. But what I've done here is I've put the vertical lines which show the reversals from um, below the blue dash line here, upside reversals, of course. And here we got 22 positive signals since the 1940s, because it starts in 1945, with only two failures. So I think that's pretty good odds. Um, and of course, it's just given a, a buy signal here by crossing from uh, being right at the, at the blue line in this case here. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is very positive. Then we're looking at the... Uh, ACWI again, this time we're looking at uh, the idea that it forming and broken out. Um, it's got uh, yesterday's closing price in it, July the 2nd. And uh, you can see it's broken above this neckline of this reverse head and shoulders. There's the shoulder, there's the head, there's the right shoulder. 
And in a previous article, I'd written 74 as a critical level, but it's now below 74 and up at 74.83. And it was up a little bit this morning, I think. So it's even higher than that. So it looks to me like a good solid breakout on the upside for the ACWI. And it is following its advanced decline line. It's my global advanced decline line, which you can plot with a symbol exclamation mark PR glad. Uh, and it's made a new high too. So that to me is very, very positive for global equities. Uh, now we're looking at stocks versus bonds. And here's an interesting combination because the ratio is trading between these two converging lines, the red line and the downward sloping green line. And the red line obviously is the more significant of the two because it goes back to 2016. This, uh, the green line only goes back to 2018. And the red line has been touched more times. Also, you can see the special K in a bottom window is broken below this neckline of this head and shoulders top. And its signal line is coming down. So that's all that suggests that bonds are going to outperform stocks. Except for the fact that stock, the ratio is very is running back. Its KST is at neutral, so it probably has further to go on the upside. And it could well take it through the red line and the green line on this short-term rally. And if that was the case, it might even just go back above its 200-day moving average and the green line. Obviously, this is what woulda, shoulda, coulda, but it's something to watch because this ratio is obviously <clears throat> approaching a moment of truth here. Given what we're seeing in the stock market, what I'm going to show you in the bond market, I'm expecting this ratio of stocks against bonds to break out on the upside. But we're going to have to wait and see. But it's, it's at a very inter interesting point. It doesn't tell us that stocks are going down and bonds are going up or bonds are going up and stocks are going down. It just tells us that whichever way this breaks out, if it breaks to the upside, stocks are likely to outperform bonds and vice, vice versa. It's a, relation, it's a relative relationship. One of the th I've shown you a lot of very positive indicators. And one of the things that I would like to see get positive um, are some of these confidence ratios that sometimes are expressed in bond spreads. Uh, other times like we have here, we're looking at high beta versus low quality, um, high beta versus high quality stocks. Generally speaking, we want to see these ratios rising. So in other words, you look at the Fidelity Capital and Income Fund, which is basically a high yield uh, a bond fund against the Vanguard Treasury, which is obviously a, a, a good quality government fund. When this line is, when the ratio is rising, it means that people are not worried about uh, risk. Uh, they're not worried about safety. They're concerned with capturing as big a risk as possible because they're not looking for any problems in the economy. On the other hand, when it starts to fall sharply, as it was doing, let's say, even recently down here in May and June, um, sorry, April and May, people are concerned about the econ economy because they're concerned about defaults. And if they're concerned about defaults, they're going to shun the high yielding stuff and go for the treasuries, which are going to push the price down. But you can see what's happened is it's broken this trend line here. And it's a good trend line going back to 2016 again. But it kind of bounced back above the trend line, indicating that downside break could be a, a whipsaw. And we're seeing the same thing in the high beta versus the high quality. High beta is a broke down relative to the high quality. But now it's come back a little bit. We're going to have to wait and see where, where it ends up. But if they break above these green trend lines, that will be quite a positive. That will remove a negative, as I see on the, on the field. We've got to give these guys a little bit of time because sometimes they do lag the market. But confidence ratios are something that I'm going to be very interested in watching because they can show you what's happening, not with what people say, but by what people do, by either going for the high-yielding, high-risk stuff or going for the low-yielding, low-risk stuff. I'm going to pass that one there and move on to interest rates. Here we've got the one-year one treasury, and it's just dropped below its 12-month moving average here. And that's what these red lines in the past show you, that usually when it crosses below its 12-month moving average, it's a pretty reliable signal that rates are headed lower. Also, we've got the KST is in a, a still, a, I'd say, a moderately overbought condition, um, but it, but it's declining. So... Whereas with the bond yields, we've seen them come down from much, uh, much, much, in a much steeper way over the last uh, six months or so, the short rates have only started edging down, and now they've, they've started to pick up on the downside. 
So that's where I think, you know, if we're going to see lower yields, that's where we're going to see it happen, more at the short end than at the long end. So here's a chart of the 10-year. Uh, it goes back to 1970. It includes the end of the 1945 to 81 secular bull market. And then it includes all the secular bear market yields that have taken place since uh, September of 1981. When we get a reversal in a secular trend, usually you get a lot of backing and filling in in terms of the trading range. So you can see that was the end of the secular uptrend. Here's the trading range at the top, or you could expand it, include these areas over here. That, that's another period in which it uh, experienced a lot of backing and filling. I think we're going through the same process right now. We haven't yet reversed the secular downtrend line, uh, but we have been in a, a trading range for the last, uh, what's this, nine years or something of that nature. And especially in the last um, seven years or so from 2012 when we're in this, uh, we've got these two peaks of around the same level. So the red arrows tell you when uh, yields are likely to come down uh, because the KST starts to peak. And... Since 1981, this indicator has worked pretty accurately. Every, every time it, it's peaked, we've seen a decline in the yields. But that's what we should expect because those things are also going in the direction of this overall trend here, which is down. But even during the secular uptrend line, these contra-secular signals also resulted in, in declines in rates. Smaller declines, admittedly, but definitely the in indicator is working. So we saw a sell signal middle of last year. And we now see the uh, KST at around a zero level. And that would suggest that there maybe is some more downside potential. Having said that, let's take a look at a 12 month rate of change of the same entity, the 10 year yield. And I look upon the 12, year, 12 month rate of change as a kind of an elastic um, kind of thing where uh, it moves up to the 38, 40% level, the red line, and then when it gets up there and starts to reverse back, the elastic pulls back the other way. And then it comes down towards the minus 30 level or so and starts to move back up again. And what I've done is I put the, um, the, the upside reversals here where it's gone to an oversold condition, the upside reversals with the green arrows. And as you can see, when that's happened, we've always seen a rally in the yield of the 10 year, on the 10 year yield. So right now, we're right back down to the oversold level again, but it's important to wait for this indicator to reverse to the upside, because sometimes it it, it it thrashes around for six months or so in these lower echelons before it actually reverses. So that's why you wanna wait for an actual reversal before concluding that this indicator is now positive for yields. But it runs the chance, I think, next time it goes up, that we might chat, depending on where it starts from, but I would think it's going to start from somewhere not so far away from where we are now. But it's, if, it wouldn't have that far to go to go above this uh, line here joining these two highs. And then we saw that and a break of this trend line. That, to me, would be strong evidence that the secular reversal has taken place. So we're no longer in a secular downtrend or a secular sideways trend, but then that will be an uptrend. But that's... Right now, I'm just concentrating on the fact that I want to be careful about getting too bullish on bond prices, too bearish on bond yields, because they have reached this overstretched territory. Next chart shows the same sort of thing, but where you can see that the 10-year yield has broken below this red uh, support line, the, the neckline, and both the short-term and the intermediate KSTs are in a bearish mode, joining their long-term gap counterpart, which we saw on the, on the other chart. So the short, term, short rates are getting a little bit, um, a short term case is getting a little bit overdone on the downside here. So maybe we're, get, we're, we're coming to the end of this uh, bear market in yields. I'm not gonna say we are, all I'm saying is that it's not as uh, slam dunk a case for lower yields as you might think by reading the newspapers and so forth because of that overstretched 12 month rate of change. So now we're looking at the uh, relation, the ultimate, what I call the ultimate inflation deflation relationship, that between commodities and bonds, the CRB against the IEF or the seven to 10 year treasury bond. And it's sort of wavering around, which comes back to my idea of the bond market being maybe a little bit overstretched on the downside. Because it broke below this very nice trend line here, the red trend line. 
and then it moved back up and now it's moved back down again <coughs> and we see the special k doing a similar stuff to what the stock bond ratio was doing it's broken an important red line and now it's very close to breaking a smaller uh, but still significant green line and the kst is in a positive mode here so if this were to now start to rally back above the green line and the extended red line that would indicate that the commodities are going to outperform bonds and we've seen a reversal right now we have to say that the overall trend favors commodities uh, favors bonds over commodities because it's declining and it's below its 200 day moving average but it wouldn't take much to reverse it and that's what we we're saying about the bond market it wouldn't take much to reverse that either and as i was saying that also about commodities which we'll get to in a second actually we're going to get to them now so here's the crb composite broadly based index uh, on the on the upper in the upper panel and underneath is the ratio between inflation and deflation sensitive stocks which you can plot yourself with the exclamation mark pr i i pr inflation index and exclamation mark pr di deflation index so what it says is two it compares two indexes the, the inflation index which consists of um, uh, stocks that do well when when commodity prices go up, resource-based stocks, basic materials, and so forth, against stocks which do well when interest rates are falling, uh, things like utilities, REITs, uh, consumer staples, and so forth. So you can see that basically when the ratio goes the ratio goes up, what the stock market's doing, it also reflects in what commodity prices are doing. Or you could say when stock commodity prices are coming down. That's reflected in the stock market by the ratio coming down. One thing I've noticed here is that the com commodity market is could be forming a, a head and shoulders consolidation pattern. It's definitely in a trading range. If it breaks below this red line, that definitely will be the case. Uh, and you can see the same thing in the um, in the ratio is also back down to its level where it was in 2016, but it's, it's started to bounce. So both the ratio and the CRB are very finely balanced here. If the CRB and the ratio were to rally above these purple uh, dashed lines, that would be very positive for commodities. Uh, and it would be very positive for inflation sensitive stocks against deflation sensitives. Martin, on that subject, so back in 2008, you saw the big drop in oil. In 2011, we had the European financial issue, but the the commodities were starting to pull back before that. In 2014, 15, we had the big pullback in commodities. What would you say if this CRB starts to break down to lower lows? I'd get a bit, I'd, I'd get a bit concerned. But yeah, me too. <laughs> one, one of the things that's different from this false signal here, and this, well, it wasn't a false signal there. One of the things yeah. is when you look at the, uh, the rate, uh, long term KST, the commodities, then we're kind of down here. Right now, commodity, well, just a little bit below zero and turning over. Now, they're down, I want to say towards the 500 area here, but they're very, very extended on the downsides. I don't think that that is going to happen, but if it did happen, it's already happening to an overstretched market on the downside. So probably it may come down, but probably not as much as you might think. Okay. That will be my guesstimate anyway, Craig. So here's the dollar, which we talked about before, and I don't really want to come out and say the dollar's bullish or the dollar's bearish, because it's in a it's in kind of no man's land at the present time. And you can see that it was in this trading range here. It broke down from the trading range, but now it's pulled back. And uh, so it, it's not a full-fledged breakdown at this point, and it's right back to its 200-day uh, moving average again. And you can see that the uh, special K is sort of having a little bit of problems. I say on balance, because it's below the or right at the 200 day moving average, the dollar is on balance um, uh, negative. But I want to see a little bit more um, bearish news on the bit more of a breakdown before I would get um, really negative on the, on the dollar. And I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I want to talk a little bit, a little bit about the CRB composite and the Canadian dollar. So here's the two together, CRB on the top, Canadian dollar on the bottom. And this chart's here just really to point out that when you can draw a trend line on the Canadian dollar and it gets violated, you can do the same thing on the uh, CRB. It tends to mean what it says and the breakout is for real. 
So all the way through, you can see that the CRB and the Canadian dollar are moving in a similar direction, not that on a day-by-day -day basis, but over a, a few, over a few months and so forth. So the basic long-term trends, I would say are identical, but they're, they're pretty well correlated. And as you can see, even, even now with the Canadian dollar, we've got a sideways trading range and we've had a tried sideways trading range with the um, CRB. One thing now is that the, C, the Canadian dollar has a tendency, it's the same chart, CRB at the top and the Canadian at the bottom. And I just joined some of these peaks and troughs and as you can see, there's a kind of a slight wood translation to the right, meaning the Canadian dollar bottoms first and peaks first in, in all these situations. Sometimes it's coincident. Uh, here, for example, um, the Canadian dollar actually lag. Well, it's about the same bottom and about the same month there in the uh, beginning of 2009. But basically, the two series uh, are mo moving in the same direction. And if you're going to have a leader, it tends to be the Canadian dollar. So the, the point there of this exercise then is to say they're both in trading ranges. Uh, can we point to anything more positive in the Canadian dollar that would be positive for the for commodity market? And maybe we can. And there we go. So here's the Canadian dollar. It's a monthly chart with the KST at the bottom and the buy signals, the valid buy signals and the solid line and the fake signals uh, with the dash lines. We've just had a buy signal for the Canadian dollar, which puts the odds in favor of going up because it doesn't work every time, but most of the times it does. But in this particular instance, it's broken this downtrend line here and it's crossed above its 12 month moving average. So we've got a positive momentum and we've got a positive currency. So I think we've got a, a valid buy signal for the Canadian dollar. And I really like this trend line. You may think, well, why is he drawing it through so it intersects this fake move to the upside here? Well, the reason is because I look upon a trend line as a level of a dynamic level of resistance. And the more times it's been touched or approached, the greater the significance as a resistance level. And even if, it, even if it breaks above temporarily and pulls down, it still shows that the line was resistance because it couldn't hold above it. Uh, the price couldn't hold above the line. So to me, that break emphasizes the significance of the line. So it's been touched. One, two, three, four, five, or approach six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's about ten times, and it's a pretty long line. It goes back to 2012, 20, yeah, late 2012. So to me, that's a pretty solid signal that the Canadian dollar is going higher. Uh, I need to see a little bit more confirmation, and uh, we're getting some today because this is plotted up to the 3rd of July now. Uh, here we see the downtrend line on the weekly chart, and you can see that with Tuesdays, what are we today? Uh, Wednesday's close, um, we're a little bit above the line. I'd like to see a little bit more strength and I'd like to see, and then it would take it more above its 65 week exponential. But I think it's going to happen because uh, we've got a positive short term KST and a positive intermediate KST. And, so, and Martin, just to point on there, um, the reason that that peak that showed up on the monthly chart doesn't show up on this chart is because the month probably ended up in the middle of a week and this chart shows the weekend close. So that's the reason that that little. Um, peak that you saw on the monthly chart doesn't show on this chart. Is that the reason? Yeah, I, I would. That's that's the reason. Yeah, I think it's the date issue that one. This is every Friday close, and the other one is if the month end finishes on a Monday or a Tuesday, it'll it'll close on that day rather than a Friday or whatever. Yeah, so. good good point, Greg. Okay, that's why I always like to look at monthly and weekly charts so they confirm. So this one's almost confirmed. Well, I guess it has in a way. I just like to see it a little bit higher at 76, 51. Here I like to see maybe 77 on a Friday close because we're not at Friday yet. We're only at Wednesday as we're doing this. So, um, question is, you know, is that bullish for commodities? And I think if it's a valid signal, which I believe it is, uh, it's it's bullish for commodities at some point down the road. Um, it may be right now, and it may be you know three months or two months down the road because remember the Canadian dollar does lead. But it's giving us a nice, powerful piece of information that suggests that commodity prices, if they do break down, are only going to break down temporarily. And so that's, that's, I find that pretty interesting. Last couple of charts are, are golden charts. This one, <coughs> this one here uh, shows you my global gold index, where we take uh, dollar-based gold, and we take um, euro-based gold, and we take uh, yen-based gold. 
add, weight them by GMP and add them into one um, GDP, add them into one series. That's the global gold. And global gold, uh, this chart's a little bit out of date. It's the 21st. I think it, it's a little bit higher than that now, but um, I'm not quite sure. It's certainly still uh, breaking out. And remember, we had that false breakout in 1996 that we talked about in the other chart. We never got one on the global gold. This time we've got one. We also got the KST turning up from a low level on the global gold. So that looks to me to be um, pretty pretty positive. So not a, and we like gold, gold, global gold to go up because uh, that indicates, you know, if you're bullish on gold, you want it to go up because it indicates a very broad participation. Whereas if we're narrowly based on the dollar, we don't know what what's going on elsewhere. Uh, the other thing is, and I haven't drawn it, if you went back to 1980, we're right back up to the 1980 high. So it's actually, in the last few years, it's actually been a lot stronger than uh, dollar-based gold. So there is dollar-based gold on the last chart when you can see the breakout take place. And not only that, but we've got a breakout on this special K, which joins this uh, 2012 peak, 2011 peak, all the way through to these peaks in 1918, the 2018, 2019, for a decisive break to the upside. So on that, Positive note, I'm going to lead, turn it over to you, Greg. Well, I got lots of questions. So, Martin, I think um, I saw just on my Twitter feed that there was $14 trillion in negative bond yields worldwide. And I think companies like um, RDS, Royal Dutch Shell, and some of the other ones, they were able to actually sell interest rates, something like zero interest bonds or whatever. And it just seemed crazy um even even if it's a marginal uh percentage higher than that how does all of this end up like what's your thoughts on the big picture like with all of this negative does everybody start to flee the bond market and go into the equity market or do they flee the bond market and go into the cash or or what how do you expect those big negative uh bond yields to resolve i i don't know what uh, to me, it, it's it's totally irrational. I, I, don't, I don't know how, it, how it's all uh, going to resolve itself out. I've given you a lot of bullish indicators on the uh, on the on the stock market, but I, 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 I didn't put in some of the bearish stuff in terms of some of the um, valuations on some of this stuff. Like the Schiller price earnings ratio is high. It's higher than it was in 1929. It's only been higher than this for the last couple of. Um, uh, uh, years in in the uh, in the tech boom period, in the secular bull market there. So we're at we're at stratophoric stratophoric, <laughs> we're very very high levels. Yeah. Um, uh, that we've not been used to before, and I think it's going to end in tears. But at this point, the elastics these indicators are telling you the elastics going to stretch a little bit further. So why while I'm bullish on the stock market, I'm continually looking over my shoulder at the fact where it kind of we're in, in the mountain, we're climbing a mountain. We're in the snow line at this point. We've got to be very careful because we might see <laughs> You know, as I drove through the Icefields Parkway, I couldn't help but notice that the glaciers are at the top of the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> and when it gets icy, it gets slippery. Um, but the, you know, again, the markets, you know, we hit new highs on the S&P today. We hit new highs on the on uh, the NASDAQ, I think, or we're very close to uh, the TSX is trying to break out upside. There's a lot of things trying to turn higher. I will say that, you know, I, last week I was particularly bullish because I saw the commodity start to turn up and I thought the industrial metals might start to lead, suggesting the thaw with China is, is starting to happen and we could start to get some manufacturing improvement worldwide. Um, this week they're all rolling over again and I'll probably get stopped out of a few of my trades in that area. But the one, I must admit the one thing that I do not have a sentiment for is where if the bond market, if 14 trillion has negative yields, first of all, who's going to buy that? And then if, if they buy that, um, where does that money go? Because whoever sold it to somebody else has to has to get cash, and where do they put it to work? But in order to sell a bond, you need somebody to buy the bond. So my question is, if the bond market actually starts losing buyers, is that bullish or bearish? For what? 
Well, for for the big picture, yeah. Well, just in general, like, does the equity market start to start to pucker if the bond market loses its bid? Well, at some point, if 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 yields go up too much, it's always been that was a classic ending to the bull markets that yields kept going up and they would go up to different levels, and that would that would kill out kill eventually kill the stock market. It's it's all a question. I I think it all comes back to a question of confidence, and that's what this. High Schiller price earnings ratio, for example, means people are very, very confident. They're very, very optimistic because they haven't seen a bear market for 10 years. So they've forgotten that most people have forgotten what happened in 2008, 2009. But eventually, uh, the chickens come home to roost. Uh, But right now, I think we're okay. And that's what I would focus on. You know, all of my weekly um, chart data that I track kind of at the end of each week, just, you know, what percentage is bullish or bearish. Like I have nothing, zero ringing a bearish bell. So, you know, it says get long, stay long and be long. Um, I just continue to, uh, you know, I think, I think the comment was when Japan, all of a sudden, nobody wanted their bonds anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't a long drawn out affair. It basically just kind of ended. And then it was a bit like the Dutch tulip syndrome where all of a sudden there was no bids and, and it pulled everything down rather dramatically. Yeah. So um, anyway, it just seems, you know, the wily coyote cliff where you're sitting here watching $14 trillion in bonds trade negative yields where you actually pay somebody to own, <laughs> to give them your money. So here's my money and I'll pay you to have it. Um, it's, it seems quite odd that that can continue for a long period of time. I don't know, a few years ago, I wrote an article about that. And um, I found out that in Denmark, they had these negative yields on your, uh, on your mortgage. So they were paying you to take a mortgage. <laughs> it's just wow. ridiculous. It is. It's crazy to see how it all scopes out. But um, okay. And so finally, on, on the price of oil, uh, doesn't seem to be picking up and demand doesn't seem to be picking up. Do you think that's going to end up being any sort of barometer for us? Or do you think it's just got too much trading around global um, geopolitics rather than actual global supply and demand? I don't know, because I don't really have a firm a firm view on oil. It's kind of in a big trading range. Yeah. And... I can't get my head around. I think it, it, you know it's likely to go in the same direction as other commodity prices, eventually, and mm-hmm. usually. It does. Um, but in the near term, I I just I don't know. I don't have a firm view. Yeah, I noticed that like the TSX is trying to break out to new highs, and the the financial sector in Canada is starting to turn up, which usually indicates an improvement in Canada. Um, and as a commodity country, you'd think that might start to help us. But I, the real question I um, will keep watching is just, you know, how do we see some of these major commodities like, gold, um, well, copper, lithium, rare earth metals, steel, aluminum, coal, just watching to see how they behave. Because I think if they really start to underperform, it's probably telling us there's something that that goes wonky here. Yeah, and you mentioned about financials, and I... I just want to put a chart of the uh, the brokerage ETF. And it broke out today, I guess. That's beautiful. So that's so, bullish, yeah. That's a daily chart, so it is a breakout. You don't have to wait to the end of the week. It looks pretty positive. Look at the two of the KSTs are rising. The third one is kind of like it often does lags. But yeah. there's a lot of industrials have, have a chart not so dissimilar from that too. So there's a lot of sectors that are beginning to look like they're breaking to the upside. And then the more you have, obviously, the, the bigger the bullish picture. You bet. Hey, Martin, we're out of time. But thank you for taking the time to share those charts with us. Your, your charts are definitely um, unique and, and give us, uh, you know, new insights to the market. So thank you for taking the time to share. We look forward to catching up with you in August. Thanks again. Thank you.